Hello and welcome to Survival from Severe Head Injury. My name is David Woodruff. In this segment here, I want to talk a little bit about how somebody could actually end up having something that looks like a very severe type of a head injury and yet end up having very little in the way of symptoms and long-term consequences from that. Uh, when I was preparing this, it kind of reminded me of a situation that occurred many years ago when I worked in the emergency department and a uh, guy walked in the front door, maybe I should say more along the lines of kind of a uh, jogging stumble through the front door, and uh, he had a screwdriver that was uh, piercing his head. And uh, we've got to have a little bit of a gory picture here. Uh, this is not the gentleman that I was referring to, but uh, this would be a similar kind of situation that had occurred. So the gentleman came into the emergency room just walking in with this screwdriver hanging out of his head and was perfectly alert and oriented, able to carry on a conversation. They took him to the OR and neurosurgery was able to remove the screwdriver, had not penetrated any real essential features of the brain, and he was able to have no real long-term consequences from that injury. This reminds me of another kind of a famous type of an injury that occurred to a patient many years ago. A gentleman named Phineas Gage uh, was a, a foreman on the railway, and they were putting down some new lines, and they had to blast their way through uh, a passageway so that they could get the tracks to go through this passageway in um, Vermont. So they had a passageway similar to this, and they had to cut through the rocks so that they could get the train tracks to go through and allow the passage of the train. In order to do that, what they did was they would put dynamite into the rock and blow up the rock. Well, in order to get the dynamite into the rock, they had to first kind of drill down into the rock, and they used these long pipes. They're about three feet long, and at the the biggest end, there it's about an inch and a quarter in its diameter. So uh, this is fairly, and they're about three feet long, so they're a pretty long piece of um, pipe or piece of uh, metal, and it's called a tapping iron. A tapping iron was pounded in through the into the ground and it kind of tapered on down to the other end and it was pounded down into the rock and it formed a hole by which then they could put the dynamite into the hole and then they could explode that section of rock out and cut their way through the rock. Well apparently when they were working on this they had left one of these tapping irons near the dynamite and when the dynamite exploded it shot the tapping iron through the air. As reported by one of the local newspapers, as a horrible accident, Mr. Phineas Gage, uh, foreman on the railway, had this blast powder explode, uh, shooting this iron instrument through his head, and uh, they said it's an inch and a fourth in circumference. It was actually an inch and a quarter in diameter. And the iron went through his face, through his upper jaw, passing out to the top of his head, and it, basically what they said at that point in time is that he was stable, but he definitely, you know, most people probably would not have imagined that he would have lived. When this iron went through his skull, and these are come some computer pictures of what that may have looked like and how it was going through the patient's head. So it went through underneath his left cheek and went up through the right frontal lobe, and uh, it obviously then exited the top of the head. So that's one computer illustration of what that would look like and this is another illustration of what that looked like. The picture on the bottom there, letter C, is showing the, the tapping iron coming up through the bottom. It came up through the bottom of his face as illustrated here in letter B. So you can see uh, what that would look like on the actual face. It came up through his cheek and exited through the top of the head. And then you can see what happened to the skull at the top of the head. There was a nice clean hole at the base of the skull where the tapping iron went through. The entry wound was very nice and clean. The exit wound was a little bit messier and it kind of punched out a couple pieces of skull in the process leaving a fairly large hole in the skull at the top of the patient's head. Now from reports from witnesses etc they said that Mr. Phineas Gage did not even lose consciousness on the scene. Well, he was transported to a doctor's office and the doctor took very good care of him and kind of nursed him back to health and over a period of time he was able to go back into some normal daily activity. Initially he had some difficulty with being able to integrate into society. He was described as being unreliable, unemployable, drunken, and a drifter. However, 
When we take a closer look at what happened with Mr. Phineas Gage, we find out that, and again, here's a picture on the left of what the skull would look like, and actually that skull, his, his actual skull, is in the Harvard Medical um, hospital museum and so they actually have his actual skull there so that they can show people uh, the injuries that occurred because uh, quite a phenomena that, that occurred with him and you can see him holding the tapping iron here in his left hand notice that of course he has lost sight in the left eye so obviously when this went through it it injured his eye significantly it injured uh, the structures of his eye significantly so his his eye was removed so he had sight still in his right eye but not in the left and so you can see that I think more clearly from the picture that you're getting here However, after a period of time, maybe a period of as little as three months or so, he started to regain some of his composure. Initially, he had uh, kind of a violent streak to him and was uh, described by people as being um, kind of out of control, at least uh, emotionally. However, eventually, he started to gain a little bit more of his senses back. And for a while, he spent a little bit of time you know, kind of running around the country and showing people his injuries and telling his story uh, being one of the great wonders of the world and running around the United States with his you know look at the headlines his brains blown out okay well obviously they didn't blow out all of his brains it was just a, one particular part of his brain that had been affected Later on, though, in his life, he was employed as a stagecoach operator for a number of years, maybe as many as 10 years, he was operating stagecoach. And obviously, that's one of the things that, you know, that takes some judgment, that takes some fine motor skill and things like that. And he it was a very competent stagecoach driver. Um, so he, he was in one employer for quite a long period of time. So people obviously trusted his judgment at some point in time here after the accident. So this brings up a couple of points about head injuries. First of all, it's going to be important as to what part of the brain is going to be affected as to what kind of symptoms we're going to see from the injury that occurred to the patient. So in his case here, we're talking about the frontal lobe. So we, and especially since we're talking about the right side of the frontal lobe, we can see some problems with the thought process and behavior. So the frontal lobe is concerned with memory, it's concerned with thinking processes, and it's also concerned somewhat with uh, controlling our behavior. So different kind of a process than what would have occurred had that iron gone through maybe the brain stem or gone through the occipital lobe or some other part of the brain. So because it only went through the frontal lobe, and if you go back and look at those pictures of the way that it went through the skull, you can see that it really just penetrated the frontal lobe. However, it did disrupt the frontal lobe considerably. Now, this is something else that we have to consider, maybe with a person who's had a stroke. Somebody who's had a stroke, a CVA, there's an area of the brain that has become necrotic. It's dead. However, a lot of times they can regain function. Part of the way that this happens is that other parts of the brain will take over the function for the part that's been injured. So there can be some regeneration, even though the nerves themselves are not regenerating, there can be some regeneration of function. So the symptoms we see in a neurologic injury are going to depend upon what part of the brain was affected and the type of the injury. Now, had this been a blunt trauma to his head and rather than a penetrating trauma, there probably would have been more global injury from cerebral edema, maybe from secondary bleeding and things like that. But in his case, being a penetrating trauma, it was a very narrow area of injury. And fortunately, that area of injury was in a part of the brain that did not cause him to have a loss of maybe his respiratory function, his cardiac function, but instead was involved mostly with memory and thought processes. Neurologic recovery then would fall under a number of different categories. First of all, physiologic. So we have to heal up those brain, the part of the brain that's been injured. In this case here with Phineas Gage, he had a large part of the frontal lobe that was injured. Now, it's not just a matter of that bar going through the brain and ripping out some brain tissue. Remember, the brain is a very vascular organ. So there could be a significant amount of bleeding. There could be some necrotic injury. There could be some infection that occurs in that area. So there's a lot of physiologic healing that must occur with this brain injury. Next we have psychological recovery. In Phineas Gage's case, it appears that he had some psychological recovery as he went throughout his life. Now, that's not something that happened right away, within a week or a month even. That's something that probably occurred over a period of years from the best 
uh, records that we have talking about his situation. We also have functional recovery. How well is the patient able to recover functionally, be able to carry out their activities of daily living? So that's the functional recovery part. And then there's social recovery. And obviously Phineas Gage was able to have a significant social recovery from going from being somebody who's unreliable and drunken to being somebody who was reliable stagecoach operator for a number of years. Unfortunately, Phineas Gage eventually ended up dying of a seizure. So in those days they didn't have the kind of medications we have to control seizures, didn't know that much about seizures, we weren't able to do EEGs and localized seizures and things like that. But he developed a seizure disorder after this injury. And he had a pretty good uh, amount of the brain tissue that had been disrupted and so we had some areas of the brain that were probably a little bit irritable that could start seizure activity. But he did have seizure activity and eventually died from one of the seizures he had. So just because somebody has what looks like from the outside a severe head injury does not necessarily mean that the patient is going to end up having long-term consequences that we might expect. We need to do more of an assessment and consider what part of the brain was injured in order to really know what the recovery might be like. Thank you for joining me for Survival from Severe Head Injury. My name is David Woodruff and until next time, bye now.